you do not want to get braces until you consider the position of your head sitting on top of your neck. And there's a very common postural distortion where the neck is rotated to the right, this would be my right side, and then the head has to twist back to the left to stay straight. So this is what it looked like. This is very normal in an asymmetrically designed human, especially as we get older. The younger you are, the less likely it's going to be a problem. But if you're considering getting braces or any type of oral cavity orthodontic treatment, you want to consider the position that your body is in first, your posture, because that posture of your lower body and then your neck and your head will influence the position that the dentist or orthodontist finds your jaw in and it influences how the teeth are touching. So when people see an orthodontist or a, or a dentist to get their teeth straightened, the mispositioned teeth might simply be reflecting a body underneath it that is mispositioned. And then if you straighten the teeth on top of that body, it can be problematic because it locks you into this poor postural position and now your body can start to hurt. And I have an interview with Frank Mallon from Philadelphia, from the Philadelphia area who does a lot of integration with this discipline of postural restoration with dentistry because a lot of his patients need that dentistry to help relocate their head on top of their body properly because they're being held in an inappropriate position because of what's going on inside of their oral cavity. Not all of his clients or patients get orthodontic. Some people just need a splint and we're gonna talk about that. It's a mandibular splint like the picture, like this picture. I've made other videos about this so if you're interested in this topic, there's other videos on my YouTube channel about this. Look at these pictures from me when I was young. This is exactly what happened to me. You can already see the asymmetry in my face as a youngster and then in my teenage years, it just got worse. And my head was sitting on top of my body in an awkward position. When they fixed those teeth and straightened those teeth, it just locked me into that position. And I've spent the past 12 years since I discovered postural restoration trying to unwind all of these issues. So in this discussion, we talk about the importance of molars and canines and jaw movement for your brain to understand where you are in space, which equals posture. We talk about pterygoid muscles. We talk about the relationship to the pelvic floor. We talk about a Parkinson's patient who, whose symptoms immediately got better once he sensed his left molars again. We talk about the importance of getting the body neutral first, get your body back to center and as stable as possible before starting any type of orthodontic treatment. And we, towards the end, we talk about the exact process that he goes through with patients uh, to understand how this whole process comes together. So if you're, in, if you're interested in it, I highly recommend watching the entire video. And when you see the difference that proper oral cavity integration can make on someone's stability and balance, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's shocking to me that, you know, that it's not considered part of the vestibular system, even though we know that everything is one thing right. and it can be separate from it, but still it's treated completely differently. And yeah. if you do that, you, it's hard, it would be hard for someone who doesn't see it from that big picture to understand how putting something in someone's mouth in a good way, or maybe not a good way, depending on the situation could really either ground somebody completely or mm -hmm. disorient them if they're in the wrong position. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, that's really what we're going to be talking about in this. Yeah. Especially, you know, in this mandible, it's not just like hanging here around all this fixed stuff. It's integrating very, you know, cohesively. And it's a two-way street with what's happening with the, the M, but also with the T's, with the temporal bones and the TMJ. You know, people just think it's, all right, where's this thing at? But yeah. this is really a reflection of what's happening at the at the T's, at the yeah. temporal. And, um, and, and what's happening at the neck and the rest God. of the body because of extension. Um, so... Let's go. So, because you had such a fascinating story, it's hard to know where to start exactly because you have such a, I, let's talk about your personal story because that was sure. like, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> just so people know, Frank has a history or has a story of dental integration. So not only does he perform it, he's experienced it just like I have. Now I don't perform it much because it's kind of outside my scope of practice to a degree, but um, I definitely know the influence of it. So you speak from personal experience. I just want you to explain your, your situation, how, it, how you came to oral integration, because it's, sure. it, it's not what one would expect. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. So, you know, I was um, in the process of taking some of the primary, you know, PRI courses and, and 
you know, I really felt like it was it was helping me become a better therapist. But at the same time, I was just about a year or two out of um, having gone through uh, a six month about uh, a round of chemotherapy for uh, lymphoma. And, uh, you know, fortunately, the, the chemo worked for the cancer. But uh, after my treatments, I was starting to experience a lot of other bizarre and scary kind of neurologic things that um, I wasn't really able to get very good answers for in the traditional medical system. And I was going to a lot of the top people, you know, in Philly and, you know, and they were um, t trying to tell me, oh, it's just because, you know, you got sick when you were young and you know too much and it's just anxiety and all this stuff. And, um, but I knew there was a lot going on, you know, so I, I was trying really hard to, you know, fix myself, but, you know, some of these symptoms were getting more and more debilitating and more and more concerning. And, um, I have a history of, you know, playing contact sports all up and through college. Huh. And, um, you know, I, one of the main concerning things was this muscle twitching that I was getting kind of throughout my body. And, uh, I had basically gotten to the point where I had kind of convinced myself that, you know, I had a very serious uh, neurologic disorder and that I was actually dying. And um, I was going to neurologists every year, getting EMGs. And every year I'd go into it thinking, this is going to be the year where they tell me like, all right, it's finally showing up. It's bad enough now on our tests and go home and get your affairs in order. And and you know that kind of thing, and, and I had pretty much just accepted that, and um, but I was at the time taking a course that it was before it was called Cervical Revolution. Um, it was the PRI Dental course uh, before that, the TMCC course, and um, I was sitting in the front row, and I had never met Ron personally before, um, but was you know kind of fascinated by the course, and at the end of the first day. Um, he, there were some people that were, we learned a, a manual technique for the, the head and the, there was a, um, couple, he let a couple people, you know, practice it on him so he could give them the feedback. Oh, and really? I, oh, yeah, I, and I actually still have, I wish the, I could do that. <laughs> I actually have the, um, the video of all of this because, uh, one of my colleagues at the time was actually filming it just because I was thinking I was just going to be getting the feedback on, uh, you know, and, uh. You know, after he told me to like ease up my pressure about four hundred percent, he said. Uh, he's he he said uh, he turned to me and he said, "Tell me about your eye." And I said, "What?" And he said, "Yeah, you have a left esotropic, you know, whatever." And I said, "Really?" And I and I didn't. I had never had an eye issue or problem, a visual thing, nothing at all. Um, I mean, I was color. I'm colorblind, but that was about it. You know, I could yeah. always see. Yeah clearly, you know, and so um, he, you know, so um, he said, you probably have some health issues going on, don't you? And he had no idea of what I was dealing with at the time and where I was at with things. And I kind of said, yeah, yeah, I do, <laughs> you know, and um, so he gave me a couple of things to kind of investigate. But fast forward, you know, a couple months later, things had actually started to get even worse. And I found myself on a plane uh, out to Lincoln, Nebraska to get treated. And that really started to turn the corner for things for me. And, you know, when I put that splint in my mouth and um, had had those glasses on, and it was the first time I could feel my head turn, get that right cervical side bending. And I didn't even know that I'd never had it, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't know. <laughs> right. When I felt it for the first time, it was like, oh my God, what is this? And, you know, and it just kicked off what, you know, it was a journey and a whole process, but it was from there, everything just kept getting better and better. And, um, you know, through that, I, I learned a lot about the process and how the process can um, be structured in a way that can be helpful uh, for people and can be a, a good resource for them. Um, and it helped me, you know, understand a lot about the patient experience, which um, I, I needed to go through in order to be an effective provider with these kinds of, of methods. So, yeah. um, you know, I realized that, you know, um, you know, not everybody can get on a plane to go out to Nebraska. And even if they do, uh, it still requires a lot of, you know, management often in between. Follow up. Yeah. 
yeah. the follow-ups, you know, yeah. the, unfortunately it's not like you just get the splint and the glasses and now if, you, you don't have any problems, you know, if it's like it, now you have the tools to kind of kickstart the journey basically in a right. way where you're not going to be fighting your own neurology. Right. And so, right. Cause I, cause I've made videos about this process before mm -hmm. and you can see in the comments, people say, Hey, where can I buy one of those? And, I, right. and I, right. you know, and I was like, that's not what this is. Right. Like, right. I, I try my best to explain that this is a legitimate process. This is not something you just pop in and everything goes away. I know it's still, it's such an abstract subject. So I understand why right. people are like, what do you mean? Can I just put something in my mouth? That's probably yeah. what, you know, if I didn't know what I know, I'd probably think the same thing, right. but it is an actual process, mm -hmm. not only to get the orthotic, the splint, and, and we use mandibular splints, um, because you need professional help to guide you through the process, mm -hmm. uh, because the dentist might know what they're doing and, and like how to make it. But again, if the dentist doesn't already understand the point of view of postural restoration, yeah. why it's made a certain way, they could make it in their own way right. from a dental perspective seems perfect from their dental perspective. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what this person needs based on what I see, yes. but that might not be what the, phys what the PRI therapist wants it for. Right. And that has to, that chant, that communication has to be there. Yeah. Uh, otherwise they could make the wrong type of device or splint that really doesn't help or could kind of make things a little bit worse uh, exactly. in a way if it's made with, in a, with something that someone doesn't need more of. Right. And when I work with, yeah. And when I work with dentists, you know, uh, um, to make these splints, uh, you know, I'm there when we take the bite registration, which is basically the way that the top and bottom teeth are positioned when your body's um, in an optimal state. Now, if, if you were just in a, a dental chair, in most cases, they're not going to have a, 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 and it's no fault of their own, but they're not going to be able to appreciate the position of where your neck and your occiput and your C1 and your C2 and your temporal bones all are when they take this that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, where this back of the head, this occiput yeah. is yeah. sitting on top of this atlas mm -hmm. and how it relates to the frame and magnum in the brainstem because we're really trying to center the head over the body again for someone right. who's assumed a f generally a forward head type of position yeah and they're in this cranial i guess would be extent well, or occipital yeah. extension <laughs> and if you notice like how your teeth touch and you just change your head or neck position <laughs> just slightly you're going to see subtle changes and those little changes are huge for the proprioceptive yeah. components of um how the brain picks up the occlusal sense. And, and so being able to make sure that the body, that that splint is built to the most neutral version of the person so that we can get it to actually give um, that cranium, that head a good home. is, is Yeah, cool. so that's a huge uh, concept. And that leads to one of my original topics that I want to discuss with you in the sense of how those molars and canines Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm the whole mouth, really, but let's just talk about molars and canines. I just call it, call them kind of the four pillars mm -hmm. of, yeah. of the cranium, basically. It holds that cranium above that body in, a, in, in the right position yeah. to help you find a home base, a midline, to find mm -hmm. center again. So when people have an oral cavity issue, maybe it's a, they, they have a missing tooth, something got pulled out, there's a, a mandible has shifted, they have malocclusion that shifted things around and they just can't get a stable home base. Or maybe they had a botched, you know, orthodontic type of experience because mm -hmm. they didn't realize they were stuck in a pattern and mm -hmm. the orthodontist trying to straighten things. It's like, well, it just doesn't, won't, it won't go. It won't straighten. Yeah. Like, why won't or they straighten them, but now you're locked into this twisted body yeah. Yeah. and you have the perfect occlusion. Perfect. They, they'll tell you, we did our job. Look how great your smile is. Yeah. But so, kind of but, yeah. so let's talk about that because there are some people, so the importance of molars and canines, yeah. the entire mouth, but focusing on molars and canines as references, as, as GPS coordinates for your brain to figure out where you're going and what you're doing. Sure. And then how, what happens if you find someone who the, the jaw or the bite is so off that you can't really get them into a neutral state necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then I think it would be more like you're going to have to do a splint that could help guide the jaw into a better position. Mm -hmm. uh, because you might not be able to get them into the perfect neutral state before yeah. they actually get a splint. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so can we just go yeah. into that a little bit? So yeah, the first part, like as far as if we start with the molars, okay, those molars are built to handle perpendicular forces, right? Vertical forces, I should say, vertical oh. and kind of more compressive type forces. Yeah, and so. I think of the molars as good anchors, uh -huh. you know, to get to, and, and those anchors up here also work with other anchors in the rest of our body, such as our ischial seats, our butt bones, and our heels, you yes. know, among others. And, and those three, ten, and, and I correlate them to a lot of times with patients, like about like those, those inflated parade floats on Thanksgiving Day, yeah. right? And so I say, you know, we need people on the ground on the left side, yes. you know, a lot of times to really give us that anchor, right? Yeah. And that molar can be, those molars are a huge, huge one. So if, and, and, and so that's where we want to make sure that we have a good starting position with the head on neck in an optimal position. Because if you have an anchor there, it's going to help with your ability to sense the ground, your ability to sense the, the floor, your ability to, to walk in a regulated way where you're actually optimizing the potential energy uh, and shift and tra uh, of your pelvis and rib cage. But so we, we need those as a good, even starting point. And if you feel one more than the other, you know, it's, it's either going to cause your body to make a shift in order to try to maximize evenness there. Um, or it's going to throw off the activity of your neck and how your body regulates its, its tension. So, um, so we always got to start there. Can you feel your back teeth? Does it feel even on side to side? And can you do that from a balanced kind of neutral state? People say, oh, yeah, you know, I think I can get it. Yeah, 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 they have to really. Like, yeah. Well, that's not the same game, right? So let me just, let me just point out for the listeners, just think of it in this easy way to think about why this is important. Molars, sit bones, and heels, and let's just say hamstrings, are all in the back of your body, right? Mm -hmm. You got a front and a back. If your back is not, if the back part of your body is not grounded with through all those senses, you're gonna fall forward. And so just think of molars and how, what's the connection between molars, heels, and hamstrings, and initial seats? Well, it's all in the back. <laughs> And you need that foundation from the back. Otherwise, you fall forward into a forward head posture on mm -hmm. one or both sides. Yeah, yeah. And, and then if we move to the canines, you see, it's not, it's, it's not ideal for us to be locked into those back teeth all day as we walk around. But we need to be able to move our jaw off of this home and still maintain a sense of kind of where we are in space. Yeah. And so when we can appropriately and in a balanced way, move off of our molars and move to one side and drop off the molar and feel a canine here. And then same thing on the other side, that's what gives our brain actually a good sense of a right pole and a left pole to understand where its midline is. Mm -hmm. So we, we get a good sense of our midline by knowing where the borders of the right and the left are. Right. And that will help really, and having a good sense of that, among other things, will really help regulate neck tension. But if when we go off of our molars and we go to move, now, and, and for the purposes of this discussion, we're saying right and left for canines, there's also a certain amount of protrusive balance that we need, you oh. know, in order to, and, and all of that helps us use our pterygoid muscles, which also help us ensure that our temporal bones can maintain an optimal balanced position, which as your listeners know, Neil, are the, are the pelvic bones of the head. So yes. as we, as we can use those pterygoids in a balanced and proper way to get proprioceptive contact at the ideal times, that gives our brain a good sense of center, it shuts off our neck muscles and it, from having to work too much as stabilizers. And if that's, and if we're doing it from a good home base, uh, a, a PRI therapist who's looking at this is going to ensure that your occiput or your head or cranium on your, on your atlas on C1 is in a good place to preserve optimal space around that brain stem and 
in that area. So it's really, a, and, and, and if when we go off and to, to move off of those molars, even if we have them and we don't get those canines or we get maybe a premolar behind it, or we get, you know, something in the front too much too soon. And we, we don't quite get a true sense of that. Then the brain gets confused yeah. and that will significantly increase neck tension and it'll increase our position in order to try to maintain a true sense of where things are in space, but it comes at a consequence and it shifts our brain's sense of the midline. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and I remember just from personal experience when I was still kind of twerked, well, no, I wasn't kind of, I was, <laughs> I remember, uh, when I was in massage therapy school and I always tell people <laughs> I went to massage therapy school for one reason, for one muscle and one muscle only the subclavius <laughs> so, oh, wow. because I knew it was so common and yeah. I'm not a physical therapist. So legally I needed to be able to touch people without, you know, fear. Yeah. Um, and so I spent, you know, 12, $14,000 for one wow. muscle, the subclavius. But anyway, <laughs> when I was, when I was in massage therapy school, uh, the, the teacher, she actually did a lot of like oral cavity type of massage. That was one of her specialties. And I said, where are the pterygoids? Cause I knew what they, I knew they were, they were, but how I was like, how do you feel them? And she goes, oh, it's easy. And she just put her, she just went like this. And I literally screamed because <laughs> my pterygoids were holding me up. They yes. were so, because I was still in this position. Mm -hmm. I had lost posterior stability. Cause I still, again, my right hamstring didn't come online until this year, which is crazy, but you know, I was so far forward that these pterygoids were way overworking and my mandibular elevators were yeah. probably overworking, which were probably also causing the tension. But I remember Ron saying one point, like, you know, uh, posture starts at the pterygoids. It's like, yeah. what? <laughs> until you understand how he, like, how that really does, is true. Yeah. Because without a balanced movement of a mandible, that head is not going to sit properly on top of the body. And if the head can't sit properly on top of the neck and the body, you're, you can't move. You're, you're held hostage by your, by neck tension. Uh, so those pterygoids screamed at me and mm -hmm. now I don't feel a thing. Yeah. Like it's just normal. But it was like, when she did that, like, oh my God, mm -hmm. it was so tense. Yeah. And now, of course. Now that the version of your pterygoids that exists in your pelvis can work, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but now yeah. you can find them. You don't need these to triple down as much in how much they need to do to contribute to your stability. And yeah. we can shift them to, yeah. you know, having the other more true jobs that they, you know, they can stabilize, but they shouldn't be doing all of it. You right, know? right, right, right. Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great point. When you, when you can uh, restore appropriate alternating function of the pterygoids, jaw musculature, Mm -hmm. uh, so the pterygoids, so people don't know, pterygoids move your jaw to the opposite side as, I think it's only through chewing. I don't think it's through speaking. I think it's mostly a chewing motion, I think. But at any rate, they move the jaw one side and your body or head to the other, right? So mm -hmm. they're really important for life. Yeah. And when they are not working properly because of the influence on the neck and neck tension that will then hold you into a state of extension, you can then, you don't have control of your pelvis. These, right. these temporal bones don't temporal bones. rotate the way they're supposed to. So the direct connection between the temporal bones in the cranium and how the, the pelvis works is, is, is there. Cranial mm -hmm. signal people know that. They, don't, maybe yeah. not, they don't, might not take it to the level that we take it, but they mm -hmm. know it's all one functional unit. So if you lose cranial function appropriately because your jaw is locked up, you really have a hard time getting control of, let's say you have pelvic floor issues. Yeah, like, it just won't stop. Why? And then it could be coming from, and you're treating the pelvic floor constantly, <laughs> but if up here is not functioning the way it needs to, to allow for freedom of movement down mm -hmm. low, you can work on the pelvis all day long and it might not change much. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I try to, you know, explain it like three hula hoops. You got a hula hoop here. You yeah, a hula hoop here, your sternum, and a hula hoop around the sacrum, right? And they all need to kind of shift and rotate and move. And mm -hmm. if one is stuck a certain way, the other two are going to try to have to make up the difference, you know? And that could be coming from the bottom up to the top or vice versa down. And I know you know that, but, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and there's similar musculature layouts of each of those regions 
you know, that kind of mirror each other. So you yeah. can, you know, we can say that you have a version of your pterygoids in your pelvis. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, and there's a version of your adductors in your cranium, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a huge aha moment for people when you realize calling this a pterygoid and this an adductor are just labels. Yeah. They're just muscles. That's, you mm -hmm. know, we class, we label things. Yeah, we came up with things. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nature yeah. didn't come up with that. That last, mm -hmm. they're just muscles that move things, right? Mm -hmm. And we call one yeah. an adductor and one a pterygoid. In reality, you know, you could call this an adductor because I think it does adduct the temporal bones to a degree or internally rotate them. But at any rate, so so those the the molars and the canines give your brain that reference of what's to the right, what's to the left, so you can find your midline. Find and, your midline and have an airway there. And yes, and and, and open up the airway because a lot of people who are in a forward head posture they might have a very compromised airway which mm -hmm. can then influence the way they breathe, whether they can breathe through their nose at all, because right. obviously if you're mouth breathing, it's going to promote more neck hyperactivity. And if uh, you're working more here to, to get those references, you know, all this stuff's going to get tighter. It's going to pull this larynx up. It's going to tighten up these things. And then you may have to tour twerk. in order to manage an airway. And, 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 you know, now you're stuck out here because this is how you can breathe the best, but your head will be forward. If you know your cranium can't shift in in an optimal position on your um in, in your upper cervical area, and you know that tension and that torque can cause you to have to be here because this is how you can breathe. Yeah, and it influences everything down low. Absolutely, and that's that's the important point, and why mm -hmm. really splints are used in posture restoration is to mm -hmm. for people who are not necessarily completely dental patients, like they might not need anything other than a splint because they right. just somehow through normal patterning yes normal overuse it could be someone who pitched too much with the right arm mm -hmm. they just developed a lot of right neck tension and mm -hmm. it started to shift their jaw just a little bit or maybe it just gave them a little bit of too much uh ref uh you know canine contact that their brain seized upon as the right position to be in right and sometimes that won't just go away through normal pri tech it could but sometimes if it's become a habit that's yeah. where, and your brain will just keep going back to it. That's where the splint might be needed, even though your teeth may look perfectly fine. Right. That's, that's the yeah. fascinating thing. Yeah. But if your brain establishes that habit like it did for me as this right canine for me being that guidance point. Yeah. And it'll just keep going back to it, keep going back to it. Uh, it's weird because I remember the, one of the, when I had some of the, my aha moments personally, I got someone's, I saw his canines were, you know, inappropriately contacting. We got them, yeah. you know, through, some techniques we got him neutral it's like don't let your teeth touch don't let your teeth touch lie down all his range of motion was there i have his head in my hands i'm side bending his neck showing how much side bending he has and i said okay let your teeth touch and once his teeth touched that neck just yeah it's, <laughs> it's in my hands i'm like and he was like oh my god like why does it move anymore i'm like that's the reason yeah. and he actually ended up going out to to lincoln but yeah. um so so that was the that's the importance of molars and canines and just real quick tell the story about the parkinson's patient and the, yeah, the so, so yeah i had a um i had a patient recently who um was diagnosed with parkinson's and was very heavily medicated it early on and i think now if he looks back he he may think a little bit he he may wish that maybe he had taken a different approach in the in the early days but um at the time, he, he was very heavily medicated and he started to develop uh, some dystonia and some, some dyskinesia. So, can you, can you just explain those yeah, terms? So, if you think about um, what you would see in like a, um, like, a, like a Michael J. Fox type of thing where, you know, you're even in an effort to sit still, your body's kind of having some of, these, some of these writhing movements. And, you know, for him, he, he can't, it's very difficult for him to sit still. Um, it's very difficult for him to breathe and talk at the same time because of some of the muscle tonicity around his 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 psoas particularly and his diaphragm and some days are better than others and he has a um, a brain stimulator so he's always regulating that as far as turn it up turn it down a little bit playing with the timing with meds and um, and you know for him and his wife it is a 24 seven management of this and you know god bless them both because um you know they they really just they're just a remarkable couple and um you know they've taken such a uh, a proactive approach but this is i mean he was a he was a 
a surgeon. He's now on, or, or, I'm sorry, a physician. Um, he's now unable to work. And, um, you know, their life revolves around where he is, you know, in uh, if it's a good day, if it's a bad day, what his meds are, the timing and all that. So he came to me and, you know, was having more issues in the past couple of months. And one thing that we always, I always make sure of is that I, I need to take a thorough history of, you know, someone's situation and all of the issues in their medical history. I'll tell me, I'll say, tell me everything, even stuff you think could not be related, right? Right, just, right, 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 right. right. Just, you know, g- give it to me all. So um, in the process, you know, we uncovered that, you know, his symptoms seemed to worsen in the three months leading up to when he saw me, which correlated pretty directly with around the time he had a molar a left molar removed and that um you know so you know he he was pretty much already on board with the the dental piece he kind of suspected that that was okay. somehow related and so you know we got him set up right away and the night that we delivered his splint we met at the dental office and he came in he was having a really bad day to the point where you know i had the table set up and he was really having trouble um, you know, controlling the dyskinesia and his, so his body was, you know, very much oscillating. And, and, and so when we tried to d- deliver the splint, I was literally, he was laying on his back with his knees bent up, feet on the table. And I was literally holding his, his leg down, his heel down into the table. So if we come back to molars, heels, I was having to hold his heel down into the table through his knee. Um, just so he could get some some amount of stillness for the dentist to get his his splint in and we could balance it. And as soon as that splint went in and he could make he could feel some contact back there that he hadn't felt in months, mm-hmm. the whole system just completely relaxed. He could take a breath because now his psoas was not so locked on, yep. which digitates with the diaphragm. Right, so yeah, now yeah. that got some inhibition. He felt like, oh, and he was not in a, in a, in a, in a contracted ventilatory state. He could, he could take a breath. He, he, now he couldn't even lay down on the table without assistance. We put that thing in. He hopped up, no problem, stood up and walked down the hall. It was like, almost like no, no problem, you know? So, um, and that splint is working really well for him now. I think he almost rarely takes it out. Um. He, and he still is dealing with issues, you yeah. know. He has Parkinson's. Right? But but that significantly shrunk the nature of the issues that were affecting his life just by having that contact there. There was no magic in anything. No, it no, was no. giving him back some proprioceptive sense for his brain on that side of his body so he could ground himself, get a couple more guys down on the ground, hold in that parade float. Yeah. yeah. So that so that he could then feel the ground and compress into it so that he could then shut off a lot of those muscles that pull him up off the ground that weren't able to understand how to not work right that you know yeah. so yeah i used um, to always i used to always use not the parade float but i would just say hot air balloons yeah like, exactly. when they're being inflated they have to be grappled yeah as that fire hot air is being pushed into the the balloon and if you let one side go maybe because they're not strong enough on that left side it'll go to the right so i always use the grapple the left abs the left internal obliques as being the the grapple to hold that air or to hold that that rib cage appropriately Mm -hmm. rounded when you take a breath in so the air just doesn't just go right up the left side and push you back to your right side yeah, uh, but a, but a spastic hyperactive left psoas yeah will do that to you because you'll lose your left diaphragm because you lost left molar sense you lost a sense of rounding through your left side so those left abs are useless to you they, exactly. they can't work and so you're yeah, you're going to go back to your right side and then I made videos on this showing it how mm-hmm. just putting that le- giving someone left molar sense will completely change their yeah. testing and you're just seeing hip flexors turning on or turning off based off of pressure sense. Because it's just, whether it's pressure between your teeth or mm-hmm. pressure from the ground into your foot, to your brain, it's just pressure. And it expects yes. pressure to be in certain areas. And when that pressure sense is lost, it doesn't know how to get it back necessarily, right? Yeah. 
but it'll tell you there's something wrong because it's going to give you symptoms. Right. It's very nonspecific. And that's the problem. It doesn't tell you what needs to be done. It's just saying there's a problem here. Right. right. That's what's so maddening about it. it's like, what is the problem? Mm -hmm. And because this is not well known, most people are not going to think, oh, this horrible pain that I have anywhere, it could be on the left side, the right side. I mean, it just means your body is not oscillating properly. Mm -hmm. Very few people are going to think, oh, maybe it's coming from that lost molar. It's yeah. just, or, or whatever, anything inside, inside the oral cavity. It's just not understood or well known. And so it seems like magic if you see it. But mm -hmm. once you do it, I'll be like, yeah, of course, this is how yeah. it works. It's just well, so. It's just so nonchalant. Yeah, of course, of course that happens. Like, why would you not? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, 20 years ago, if you'd been like, oh, your molar, your lack of molar sense on the left is the reason you have such SI joint issues. I mean, come on, are you, get out of here. I know yeah. I, that's probably what I would, because, you know, it, I never saw it before. I mean, it's not something, and now it's just so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> do it long enough. But, you know, for, the, for someone's reference point who's never seen this stuff, it seems fantastical and like sorcery and BS, it might. Um, right. it's not, it's just pressure regulation inside the body. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, there's the ability to regulate that pressure based on the awareness of that side existing, you know? So, you know, there's, you know, it's something like 5,000 nerve endings per square millimeter mm. in the periodontal ligaments, which me, which is why when you get a, when you get a, a seed, a sesame seed stuck in your teeth, <laughs> you know it. it drives you nuts, right? Just, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or, or like a little hair in there it drives you crazy. There's nowhere else on our body that's that sensitive, yeah. you know? And so as humans, we could have evolved through time without just gnawing through meat, you know? That, but the teeth have such, a other, such an additional value to our body's overall sense of being that includes spacing the oral cavity and helping that head get where it needs to be. And then also the proprioceptive piece of it. So it's it, a lot of times it's just, oh, when your brain goes, oh, there's all those nerve endings. Okay. Now right. we understand how to, that that side exists. Yeah. So our sense of space isn't our midline is here because we think it's right, right and left or right like this, you know, it's like, oh, this is here. Oh, well then we can there's go here. Return and home. This yeah. doesn't have to work to try to manage an airway from a twisted body position underneath it. So yeah. it's largely proprioceptive. And, and you know, it's funny that when, some of the dentists I work with that I'm on site with, when the, when people stand up and walk down the halls and uh, things just shoulders even out and pelvis is level and they can feel the ground, they're like, Frank, what are you doing? What is, is this? Like they think that like, is this source? Or like, what is, you know? And I'm like, no. And, and I explained to them exactly what you just said about the the pressure piece and the proprioceptive piece and, and, and all that. and um, so it, it's really cool to see the changes, but you're right. It's not common um, knowledge knowledge for people to understand maybe why their plantar fasciitis is coming from, not you know, place. because of the, 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 what the, what the orthodontist did to them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right, right, right. Like that, right. So. Okay. So, uh, so when you see people, so in my mind, there's kind of two types of people who need dental integration. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just how I simply divide things up. One would be people who have inappropriate patterning, mm -hmm. uh, just because maybe they sat, they sit too much, they stare at a computer too much, too much neck breathing, hyperactivity starts to make changes. The neck connections to the jaw and the head start to kind of change the relationship of their jaw to their head and the rest of their body. And now they have just inappropriate tooth contact that their brain has kind of learned to use mm -hmm. as a positional, as a place to put them to breathe. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the brain won't give that up. So yeah. even with normal PRI techniques, just keeps going back to it. Like the guy whose head was in my hand, uh, mm -hmm. he needed a splint to break that habit. So the brain couldn't use those inappropriate tooth contacts anymore. And then mm -hmm. you can get your body back underneath you and mm -hmm. do what you need to do. And then it mm -hmm. works. Then there's others who they have dental issues. Like they mm -hmm. have issues that are not just, oh, this brain needs to stop sensing this one tooth. Mm -hmm. you know, too much. They, you know, the jaws are shifted. They have malocclusion. They had teeth that were moved. Maybe teeth were removed and the whole oral cavity collapsed more, you know, things of that nature, tongue ties, things like that. And they're actually dental patients just okay. as much as they are a PRI client or patient. And I don't like mm -hmm. divide it up because you can't really divide it up. Sure. You know, 
anyone who's got a dental issue is a peer at because they're going to be favoring one side. You know, they're yeah. not going to have full movement. So how do you determine who you think just needs a splint to help get that body back? that that head in the right position so they can sense their body better again mm -hmm. compared to people who like who need actual dental work one yeah. way or another whether it's expansion whether it's um you know any type of thing where they actually have to shift things around a little bit to to be able to get that harmony back yeah. like how do, you, how do you differentiate between those types of people and what do you see when they walk in that's like oh this person's just going to need a splint and i know it's not immediate and this person yeah. yeah, they're probably going to need a real dental experience Sure. So when we talk about, so first off, you know, size of the airway is always important. And also um, I'm always looking at um, the symmetry of the palate. If you look in the, the roof of the mouth and you see the ridge down the center, sometimes you'll see differences from one side yeah. to, to another, um, as far as the space from the side to the middle ridge. And that, you know, can often tell you that they're, they may benefit from some, um, from some remodeling of the cranium and there's devices that we would do that the um if there's notable cross bites mm -hmm. you know that's going to often be somebody that would likely you know it, or i would at least want to prepare them to say they're you know we may be talking about down the road some orthodontic work to help get you out of this um, it's not to say we have to, because for some people, we might be able to get them good enough um, to their standard by just with the splint that gets them out of the crossbite. And they say, you know what, I'm kind of good enough. As long as I sleep with this thing every night, wear it when I work out, I'm kind of all right. And I don't want to go through that whole orthodontic process. And that's okay. But the short answer is that regardless of which of these, which road this person's going to be on, whether it's just splint or more um, elaborate dental work, I see the work that we do with the dental integration piece most of the time as almost like pre-dentistry. So mm -hmm. even so whether we're just dealing with a splint to help repattern your body, to take away your shoulder pain or you know whatever it is, that's that's cool. But also if we're also going to have to go down this journey of balancing out cranial position and moving teeth and all of that, it's going to be important that all of that work is done on a neutral body and neck anyway. Yeah. So we, in, in some ways, we, I always would want to pretty much start with the splint to help unlock certain things to give the brain uh, what, would, what a normal occlusion would feel like. Mm -hmm. and get some of these neck muscles to regulate, retrain the position of the airway, balance out the rib cage and the pelvis. And then in time, and there, and you know, no patients ever have to commit to all levels of the process from the start. We'll, we'll see where that goes. They may say, you know, yeah, you know, I love this splint. I'm, I'm pretty good with this. Yeah. I know my teeth maybe aren't in the best position or, you know, whatever, but like, I'm, I'm okay here. And that's fine. They're, it's always about what works best for the patient yeah. and where they're at on their journey. And there's so many variables that go into how we decide on when we pull that splint in, when we start that process. Um, and, and, and it always has to work for them and they have to feel confident about that process and its ability to help them. So um, in cases where someone comes in and maybe their teeth are, you know, an obvious positional issue, I would never send them to an orthodontist right away because if, it, clearly if, if they're having issues and we're going to see it on our table tests, that there's going to be restrictions in their body and habits and patterns and sense of identity and where they are in space that all is leaving them a little bit locked up and twisted. And if we just straighten those teeth on there, in a lot of ways, it could create more problems long term because then it will just lock them in to that body positions and patterns if they haven't unlearned that. So the yeah. splint is always a good first step. And um, and then, you know, the dentists that I work with, I, um, I work with certain dentists for certain reasons because they have the skill sets to pull in these other pieces mm -hmm. if we need to. 
as somebody goes down the journey in this process. But basically, it's pre-dentistry. And I would <laughs> encourage like a pre-dentistry process, whether that includes getting a splinter for some people, if it's just some PRI techniques. Yeah. Um, anytime you're going to start moving teeth around because of how strongly they program the brain and the body's patterns. So, yeah, so that one issue, and I think this probably happens to a lot of people, and this is when someone, when adults get braces, Yeah, I'm always worried, you know, if it's before I see them or when they arrive and I ask them these questions and they say, oh yeah, I got braces when I was 35. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to be working. Pro- it doesn't seem like they couldn't get things. So and I'm like, Ugh. Right. cause from my perspective, it's more likely at that age that they've already in a pattern. I mean, Absolutely. we know they're going to be slightly in a pattern, but you know, and if now they're trying to straighten those teeth on someone yeah. who's over the age of 15 or 16, they're, you know, they're more likely to be in a more neutral state when they're younger. Yeah. And yeah. then once you get older and older, more likely, when you find like, man, my teeth have moved, let's straighten them again. It, well, it's probably because the body underneath it moved exactly. and now mispositioned the head on top of that jaw or mis- mispositioned the jaw underneath the head. And yeah. now that's why they're getting these malocclusions or maybe they start to use their tongue to push things because again, but still it's the body underneath it that changed. Exactly. It changed up here. And now they straighten it, not realizing it's their body that got mispositioned right. and now it actually just locks them in. Mm-hmm. Or they're like, yeah, I'm on my third round of Invisalign. I can't, they can't figure out why things aren't, mm-hmm. aren't working properly. Yeah. And, or they see a midline that's completely shifted one direction or another, and they don't even ask about it. They just look, we'll just straighten them again. Yeah. Or they're in some retainers and yeah. they're like every morning when I wake up, oh, my neck, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, let's see what happens when we put these retainers in, you know, especially yeah. that top one. And uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, the, the teeth are often the passengers uh, and they kind of go places based on the pressures and positions of everything around it, like you just described, you know? So if, if, we're, if we're seeing that the teeth, the tooth itself is moving, uh, the last thing I'm worried about is the tooth. That's just telling me about what's happening right. around right. me, right? So it's like, we know we're not, we don't have balanced pressures and that could be through the nasopharynx. It could be through the... The, the the throat the larynx the pelvis the rib cage whatever it is mm-hmm. um so we have to balance those those pressure gradients and then we tell the orthodontist or the dentist like okay straighten these teeth on this system you know and i and i was in braces as an adult but it was only after a, a, a process of this pre-dentistry where i was in you know splints and you know and some out and, and all that and and you know yeah i did have to straighten my teeth because of some occlusal issues that were always holding up the show but yeah. it was after uh, a process of that pre-dentistry mm. so so then my last question would be this has all been good um how do you prepare people yeah. uh, like you, you, you're pretty sure this person has a, you know, they, they have a crossbite, they have an open bite of some type. How effective, because sometimes it, it, these techniques might, are not going to be wholly effective. PRI mm-hmm. techniques, exercises mm-hmm. techniques may not be wholly effective until they get their appropriate senses back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that situation, they might not be able to hip shift to the left and get their pelvis oriented to the left and their entire body centered over their left side to really get their body underneath them because up here still is not allowing it. So how, at what point do you say, all right, there's nothing else we can really do with these techniques. We've gotten as far as we can. Like, how do you, and then say, you know, the only way I can do my work further, Mm -hmm. really resolve the pattern. Because I, I think another thing people don't understand about posture restoration is, and especially now, because I think it's sometimes misrepresented, it's not trying to treat a specific pain. It's right. trying to inhibit overuse mm-hmm. of a pattern of activity that your brain has become fundamentally dependent upon. Yeah, it's establishing so harmony. Yeah, we're trying to establish harmony through yeah. rhythm. Through rhythm, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, and and side to side chewing is rhythmic. Yeah. So that's why you know. So your brain is just pressure here, pressure here, and that is no different than walking. Pressure you're here. doing that. Your temporal bones are doing yeah. this. 
Right, and everything's rotating. And once you lose that rotation, that's when we start to hurt and we strain to try to keep moving without appropriate rotation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some people, with, when t they're not going to be able to rotate. They're not going to be able to get their body, you mm -hmm. know, to that left side to even begin the process. So mm -hmm. at what point do you say, all right, look, I don't think these techniques are going to do much further good for you or at all because they might not. I mean, they're not going to hurt necessarily, but they might not be providing any type of real benefit because their body just can't get to the position it needs to be in to make sure. use of these techniques. So at what point, how do you determine at what point you're like, look, I can't do my work anymore because I can't get you past this point right. without putting something between those teeth. Sure. So, you know, every time I work with any patient in any session, I'm always trying to figure out how can we get this person's body to do more with them having to do less? you know, so that they don't have so much stuff to do because all this stuff, this harmony, this rhythmic stuff, at the end of the day, it all needs to happen unconsciously, yeah. you know? And so, and when we're patterning, matching breathing with these positions and techniques, it's really to just establish an unconscious ability to maintain this harmony. Mm -hmm. So, you know, early on, I'm always investigating the influences of their occlusion, um, their vision, their footwear, all, all these things that significantly program us, right? And so um, I'm, oh, I'm never going to just ask somebody to sign up for this process based on a hunch, right. <laughs> you know, right, 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 right. I got a feeling because uh, there have been times where um, I've tested somebody by putting something different in their mouth and I would have bet my house that it was going to change the game and it didn't. Yeah. So that's not somebody that I'm going to say, oh, we got to go do this dental process with. So right. Right. I have to have supportive evidence that the way that their jaw is aligned and that their teeth are touching is related to the issues that they're coming to see me for. And well, you know, sometimes I say, all right, because I'm, I'm thinking, all right, is this, let me just experiment here. And mm -hmm. I, do, I do manipulate their bite and nothing changes. And actually in my mind, I'm like, oh, excellent. <laughs> because <laughs> it means I can possibly rule that out yeah because it's not yeah. a simple process right and it could be they might just have the wrong shoes right at that point exactly. even though their shoes might look fine i had a guy recently though just to interject yeah uh, and he because he was going through dental work he mm. had the alf at some point and he was in invisalign when he came in to see me I'm like all right we'll see what happens yeah and yeah. you know his tet he was you know his pelvis was forward on both sides i'm like no no and and uh, so he looked like he had the right shoes. Like his sho they were from the PRI shoe list. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm testing them, and I wasn't specifically thinking about the shoes at that point in time, but I noticed there were some things that weren't working properly. So uh, we did a couple things. Nothing really changed. I put something between his teeth, and nothing changed. So I'm like, all right, well, that's actually good. And then yeah. I went to the shoes, and I just I had him take the shoes off. Or no, I had him walk and I said, all right, what do you feel? And I explained the heel arch, big toe situation. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he, so I walked and he paid attention and he said, I feel my heel and I feel my toes. I said, what about the arch? I don't feel that. All right. So great. I just literally took out the insoles and had him walk again. He's like, oh, now I feel it. Put him mm -hmm. back on the table and he was neutral. So I realized his, he thought he had a high arch. And I looked at his arch. He does not have a high arch. So his arches were probably, his insoles were probably too high for him and yeah. were pushing him into the outside borders of his foot, which yeah. tipped his pelvis forward. But that was relieving because with his history of a lot of neck issues and the history of dental, I was like, oh no, is he in this position where they were right. doing inappropriate dental work? It turns out they weren't. It was actually beneficial. Um, yeah. It was just, he was wearing the wrong shoes. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a new, way, way easier fix than having to worry about the oral cavity. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out what's the, the best way in. What are the couple dominoes that we can knock down that allow for the rest of them to all get knocked down in, in, as far as so, somebody's issues? So um, are the tests are, are key, you know, to understanding the connection between the sensory input that's coming into the brain and how that's contributing to someone's motor output. Because Absolutely. that's really the game of this, right? Input so, first, and I try to I try to stress that constantly. Your yeah. output, the motor output, is based off of input, and I'm always fascinated yeah. that that's not unknown. <laughs> like, right, sensory right. Yeah. motor is a major part of 
I don't know about phys- if, if that was talked about in physical therapy school. I would assume that, oh, it wasn't. Well, I mean, not, not to the extent that we okay. appreciate it now. Okay. okay, but it was, was it like that process of, you know, sensory processing, determining, or, in, or uh, sensory preceding motor, it's not unknown. But yet, right, it, right, right. Yeah. But yet so many disciplines are simply trying to work on the output, and never yeah. considering the input. And, exactly. you know, even in PRI, if you only think about, hey, we're going to do a left hamstring exercise, you're yeah. actually missing the boat. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I tell people to say, look, we're going to do this right now, but I don't want you to do stuff. I want you to feel stuff feel stuff and then you'll and then you'll be able to do stuff yeah but we gotta right. get you to feel stuff in order to do stuff don't right. just try to do stuff right yeah. I, the analogy i always use is like if you ever played sports coaches would always say you know let the game come to you don't don't force yeah. It. Yeah. Same yeah. Thing. so that's what i tell when I, people are i'm having someone do a technique i, I always say look you're going to use these sensory gps coordinates mm-hmm. to allow your brain let the muscle come to you right and if Focus. it can't come to you you're going to use your pattern yeah. Try to go get it, and that's going to make life a little bit. goes up. Be, we're going to be fighting your own neurology. Yeah, and for some people, I have to explain to them, look, like this is what makes you great. It's what makes you successful at your job. It's an admirable quality. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we it's got certain situations. Here. Yeah, but it comes at an expense sometimes, yeah. you know? So so I'm always using um, the test to, to help guide our decision making. And for some people, even though we know early on there's a bite component, it doesn't always mean they need a splint on day one. So there's different ways in which we'll try to get around it. We'll try to give them certain things to do certain techniques. Sometimes, as you know, if you'll, you know, we may be able to, if someone can't feel their left molar, if we do a technique that they can do and they can replicate at home and then they can feel it and then they, and right. then that changes the pose. It's like, okay, cool. Maybe we don't need this one. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I try to ride that out as long as possible right. um, until we're clearly hitting a wall, you know, right. and you know, I'm, and so when it becomes obvious to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not helping you in any way. Um, mm-hmm. Then I may get a little bit more, uh, Aggressive is not the word, but a little bit, you know, more, of, there might be more of a lobbying effort to say, look, I really yeah. think this can be helpful for you, not because you have problems, but your body's compensating in the way it's supposed to. It's actually very healthy. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do in these conditions. It's not broken. It's not broken. We just need you to not have to be compensating around this issue as much. And we don't want to be fighting your own neurology in our attempt to kind of to kind of get things where um, it would be optimal for your system. So, um, and there's a lot of variables that go into when somebody starts that process. Um, I had a a woman, a patient who not that long ago, um, she came in and she had a lot of issues and she was dealing with a lot of stuff. She was a retired nurse and she told me day one, you're not touching my teeth. She said, I went through hell with the, this orthodontic work that I had, I don't know, 15 years ago or whatever it was. And she said, you're not touching these teeth. And I knew, you know, uh, uh, early on that that was strongly uh, relevant, but there were other low hanging fruit. So she also had a monovision LASIK correction and um, she has scoliosis, not surprising. Um, also a lot of autonomic issues and, and all that. So we got her in a pair of shoes she was willing to accept the fact that maybe she could wear some glasses, right? So we've had a, 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 a postural visual session with my neurooptometrist. We got her some better glasses. And as we started to shrink the onion, but she saw how persistent some of these other issues were, she finally said, all right, let, let, tell me about this, this dental thing that we could, you know, so, and she got on board and, and it wasn't long after we got the splint in, in addition to the other pieces that um, her x-rays started to show that her scoliosis was reversing. And she's like 72 years old, you know? So um, it's a valuable piece, but if I had tried to push that splint on her too aggressively from the jump, um, also these other issues, then, you know, I don't know how successful the process would have been or the first time she had a rough day um, after getting the splint, she mm. probably would have said, ah, the same. It's not my teeth. I don't know what to right, say. Right, 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 right. <laughs> because it's not a straight 
Right. Progress is never just, right. it's not like, hey, get the splint, everything's going to be perfect. Right, it's, exactly. You're, you're still going to have crappy days as your brain is adjusting to things and your body's adjusting to things. It's not. And it's going to give us. Yeah. There, there's, yeah, there's a process to it. Yeah. After you get the splint. And just just real quick. just So what are the two types of splint? Because in PRI, there's two, sl two types of splints. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you describe the two different types and why one is preferred over the other, depending on the person? Sure. Yeah, so there's, there's usually when we start with splints, there's two that are hard acrylic, and it has to be hard so that it doesn't allow the person to clench into it. So if it's soft in any way, if it gives in any way, um, the brain's going to figure out that quickly, and it's going to start to like to use that as a reference. And usually if we are uh, recommending that for somebody, it's because they're over-referencing certain areas of the bite. So the hard acrylic um, helps us kind of inhibit that reflex and make sure that they're not able to lock in too much where they're um, where they like to. But it also helps us ensure that we can guide and allow them to touch in new places that they're not used to in a way that kind of mimics for the brain what would happen if the teeth themselves we're touching in that way. Mm -hmm. And the two types are, um, one is a full, it's a, it's a acrylic that goes all the way around. Um, it's like a, almost like if you think of like a, a mouth guard that you would wear when you were playing sports and you just kind of turn it upside down. Um, and it would go all the way around on your bottom teeth. And that's more for occipital referencing, meaning like when you're so that you have that anterior guidance a little bit more so that when we use those pterygoids muscles that move the jaw that we talked about, when that jaw slides forward, it has a little bit of a reference there to understand how, um, where those, those front points are. And that actually helps the head sit back on the top of the cervical spine uh, a little bit better. And so um, it's really for how the occiput or the base of the skull sits on the top. And then the other is one that tends to really just help with side to side referencing and help the body understand, here's my left side, here's my right side. So if we talk about where that home was in the molars, yeah. they're mainly for molar referencing for people. Um, and really it's kind of the same as the other one. The first one I just talked about, only it doesn't have that acrylic built all the way around the front. So it's almost like just a bar that kind of um, connects the two. So why wouldn't you want someone to have the full coverage? Why would you pick the one with just the more posterior coverage? Yeah, so in some cases, um, people tend to hit too much in the front and even that, uh, that guidance can be a little bit um, confusing for them. And so sometimes, you know, the, the intent is to just take away that coverage temporarily yeah. and just make sure that they're able to use their ability to sense back here in getting that lateralization, you know? Okay. Yeah, um, okay. So that tends to be helpful for that. And, um, and that's kind of the two, the two main ones that we would, we would. Okay. Use in and so way. what, what is the process once you decide someone's going to get it, uh, yeah. What's the process of how it's made? Because that's there's a couple steps to it. Yeah. So um, the when we make a splint for somebody, we need to make that splint for their current. We need to make that splint based on with their head and neck in the optimal position. So when we do it, we can't just take scans of them sitting in a down chair take some scans, send them to a lab. Oh, this is this and, and send it back. So when I'm working with a dentist, we, I'm, I'm on site for what's called the bite registration and that there's the picture of the top teeth, there's the picture of the bottom teeth, but then the lab that's going to make it, they need to know, okay, I got my picture of the top. I got my picture of the bottom. Where do you want us to anticipate that these things touch together in the right. optimum place? And that's what really the bite registration is. Right. So when we take a bite which registration, is, which is which is different than just the molds, like the taking the impressions, is right. that that's a different. So they take impressions first, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to get like to see what the teeth look like, basically. Right. Right. And yeah. Then, they need the sense and, of the, yeah. 
And then the registration is where you're trying to find the best place for those two, the upper and the lower to come together. Exactly. And like we talked about earlier, the position of where your head is and all slightly changes how those teeth touch. So we yeah. got to tell the lab, we want you to make this splint to this mouth in with, then that's where I've ensured that the head and neck are in as good of a position as possible. So oftentimes I'm going to do some manual work. I'm often most likely holding the upper cervical spine and the head in a, an optimal position that we, we would call a a neutral position where the occiput and the cervical spine are optimally positioned. The OA joints are where we want them. So you're trying um, to get this part in the right position, like the, right. the back of the head, the occiput's relationship to the, the atlas, the cervical exactly. spine. You're trying to get that in the optimal uh, position mm -hmm. because there's a direct relationship between this occiput C1, C2 and the actual uh, you know, uh, what do we call plane. a plane? Yeah. So exactly. that's, what, and that's why you want to try to get somebody into a, as much of a neutral position as possible. Exactly. Just sticking a splint in someone's mouth. And this is why you can't just buy a splint and expect mm -hmm. it to work because right. you don't just, if you just stick, stick something in someone's mouth, who's like this, that's just kind of reinforcing what they're already in. Exactly. It's accommodating the dysfunction. Yeah. yeah. And so we would, we would, um, we want to make sure that there's an optimal 30 degree cervical lordosis when we can get it um, so that that splint is made to replicate those conditions. And if someone's getting a splint, chances are their, their normal is issues with maintaining and holding that neutral position there. So either they're living in a constant state of C2 rotation or C1 rotation or whatever it is. And we're trying to neutralize that to say, okay, we want you to make that splint to this version of the patient that's going to right. set them up best for success. So I'm often holding the yeah. head, and neck, and the cranial base, and even sometimes the position of the other bones in the head to make sure that it's right where we want it, that the body's in a relaxed parasympathetic state. And once we get it, then I'll usually like tell the dentist, like, okay, now we're ready. And then they'll come in and they'll they'll use their means to take the the in, the registration either with with goo or even sometimes once in a while with a digital scan so okay is there a test like so if, you, if you're holding that head in the neutral position mm -hmm. theoretically would they not then pass shoulder into rotation some other test like other tests you right. can do in that exact position just to make sure it's the right position yeah so oftentimes what we'll do is when well, I'll, I'll usually tell the patient, I'll say, don't let your teeth touch, you know, and we'll, and I'll say, all right, take a breath. I'll say, how do you feel? And I'll say, oh, that, you know, that feels good. Or, okay, fine. And when I tell the dentist, like, okay, we're ready. They'll come in and they'll use a little bit of the goo and they'll put it in there and we'll give it, and I'll be holding while maybe it takes about 30, 40 seconds for it to kind of dry. And then once they say, okay, we're ready, I'll leave the goo in. And then I'll ask the patient to stand and walk and, you know, we'll run, we'll run them through the tests okay, and okay. make sure that we've captured the most neutral right. version of them as possible. And, um, and there's times where, you know, we will do it and I'll go, mm, I don't know. I don't like this. Something happened. Maybe they, maybe yeah. they bit down a little bit much as we were doing it or whatever, and we'll redo it. And, and, but, you know, I always want to make sure that, um, and oftentimes people feel a difference, even with that. Even yeah. with being locked into, not locked in, but held in a better place that yeah. replicates the optimal space of the of the base of the skull around the brainstem. And they'll say, whoa, I feel the floor differently. I feel like I can, you know, um, the, the walk is different. And, uh, and I'll say, okay, well, that's what, that's what we're making. That's what we're thing. looking for, yeah. yeah. Flint is going to help replicate this version of you all the time and every time you put it in. And what we would, you know, recommend oftentimes for splints is um, there's is is pretty much always when you're sleeping. Um, it's going to be often pretty much always when you're doing any kind of corrective PRI type activities. And depending on where the patient's at as far as their functional status, we would also usually encourage them to do it with general everyday activities early on as much as possible. So if they like going for a walk, or they like, you know doing jujitsu, you know, yeah, you could probably, you could, put, you could wear it, you know, and, um, and if they have if head and neck issues that are often associated with driving distances or working at a computer, 
I'll say, yeah, put it in. You almost yeah. use it to help keep you in as good of a position as possible. And with it in, it's going to actually help start training some of these muscles to understand how to hold better positions up here. Yeah. Um, and that's really the game, you know, for people that feel like their head is so heavy or, um, you know, they have a little bit of upper cervical instability. If we've captured the position properly, then just them wearing it and walking is going to help actually start to strengthen and stabilize some areas up in there. And it's going to have beneficial uh, ripple effect throughout the, uh, throughout the system. Okay. So then <clears throat> once that registration is made, it's sent to a lab mm -hmm. generally. Correct. And it comes back and then, yep. they have to, then they have to deliver it, as you say. Exactly. And then, yeah. So that's an yeah. issue so for people who are not um, PRI, you know, knowledgeable, so to speak, the mm -hmm. idea of delivering the splint also in standing mm -hmm. rather than just sitting down. Yeah. You'd be like, well, why? And well, because bite changes whether you're standing up or sitting down. Yes. So can you just talk, kind of talk about that whole uh, delivery process? Absolutely. So um, most times it takes roughly about two weeks uh, for it to go out to the lab and come back. And we'll set that appointment up in advance, you know, anticipating that it'll be back in time. Um, and there's, um, you know, some of the dentists I work with, I'm on site with them like all day. We'll block out a whole day. And those are our like PRI splint days. So everybody on that day is coming in. They're either getting a splint or getting it adjusted you know, and we'll, we'll have that scheduled in advance. And when it comes back from the lab, we anticipate to take at least a good hour of balancing that splint. Because even though we've, we've, even though we may have perfectly captured that bite registration, that's really only the home. That's really just the starting position, like we talked about. Um, there's a lot to making sure that that splint is perfectly calibrated for that patient. And that requires us to do a lot of testing and making sure that as they move and they shift, that they're hitting the proper teeth at the proper time and there's no interferences. So mm -hmm. we have our home base, but then we want to make sure that when you move one way, that you feel the teeth specifically that we want and that um, you don't catch anything else. And that's a lot of the like, if anyone's gone through something similar, it's like tap, 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 we take it out. We look at where they're hitting. If they're hitting some buckle cusps, we take that off and shave it down. And you're that's using, all. You're using the dental paper that leaves the mark. Yeah, I have that. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I have my dental supplies. For I'm, myself. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. The um. So you know. So there's a lot that goes into making sure that okay, are we balanced? Are we hitting both sides evenly? Um, and are we when we move in any one direction? Are we hitting the proper teeth at the proper time? And, and I'm constantly asking the patients to stand and walk. I'm retesting them to help us guide to say, how do we, wh where are we happy with how this splint is at this time for this patient? Um, and, you know, like you said, Neil, the position matters. So whether you're laying down or standing, um, you know, your bite's going to change. And what we do is try to capture the um the activity of the in, or try to account for the influences of gravity on that person's system um there are times where we'll take it just in supine somebody might be getting a splint just because when they wake up in the morning sleeping is hell for them that the, the morning is the absolute worst thing so okay so let's make sure that when you're laying down that you know that's the that's where we want to match the splint to um, for some people, it's it's all active. It's all upright, moving, and, you know, in, um, accounting for the influences of upright, alternating reciprocal activity, and we'll, we'll um, check it in standing. And in most cases, we're doing both. I want to see, yeah. can we capture the best possible version in both? And if it's changing drastically between how your teeth hit it while laying down, and then how they are when you're standing up, then I have to consider, are there other influences yeah. affecting that, that we need, that I need to account for as the quarterback of this thing, as far as whether it's, you know, footwear or certain activities, the, you know, exercises that we have to have them do, or, um, you know, visual influences, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff that we all know. 
that well. visual thing can get tricky. Yeah. It can yeah. really, because, like, again, 2.75 last year. Yeah. And actually, yesterday, as we were talking, um, <laughs> I was like, why is my head tilting again? Well, now I'm down to 0 0.25. Wow. I know when my, something's wrong because my head tilts. Wow. It's the head, it's the, it's the, the tilt <laughs> and I know it immediately and wow. so 0 0.5 can't even wear that now. Um, so we can talk about that. Some wow. other time. So, but, awesome. the vision, but the, the idea that the visual, the, 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 the prescription or how someone is actually, cause the prescription is subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not an objective thing as, as, as we know, it's like the optometrist is asking you, which is more clear, one or two, one or two, right? So they're just going off based off of what you're saying. But that can really change drastically. Um, the moment your brain senses something it hasn't sensed before in a good way, whether it's the ground, mm -hmm. you know, the shoes you have on can change your prescription, how your brain is using mm -hmm. your visual system, how your mouth is being used. Mm -hmm. uh, it can, and it can change quickly. And then the right. problem becomes, you know, the change in prescription, as the vision changes, that can then change the bite also. Exactly. And it's like, all right, should we change the splint? Or is it the, if we get the vision set properly with a splint, will the mouth, will the jaw go back to its, the best position? And that right. can be like confusing because I've been through that myself. And sure. I'm like, which one is it? Is it my eye? Like, what should I do here? Um, yeah. So in a lot of cases, it can certainly be like a little bit of like a stuck drawer in a bureau you know you go to one side you wiggle it and you gotta go to the other side yeah, and, yeah. you know and it, it's really it, in my opinion it's how the brain integrates the sense of both you know yeah. when it gets to that point it's really no one system's fault or department right, it's usually right, right. it's really this, this the matanathic system it's the system of systems up in there that yeah. you know finding the right recipe and balance for all of them yeah. and, and i certainly have um and I, I do work with a neuro optometrist in the area and there's times where, you know, I'm seeing someone it's like, all right, well, now we got to go do the vision piece to update it to this, you know, new bite or a new reality yeah. or, you know, or we got to now adjust the splint to these new glasses. Yeah. And so being able to understand the right timing, it's always a little bit different for, for yeah. um, many people, but you know, if there's a strong occlusal issue, I tend to like to in most cases, I'm not going to say in general or like across the board, but um, it often I find is more efficient to start with the occlusal piece mm -hmm. because if we find a perfect prescription for someone visually, but you know their their bite is unstable and that yeah. there's and you know then that 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 script that's perfect for them on Monday morning might not even be good for them by Thursday afternoon if things are always shifting around in here. So if yeah. we have a if we have a splint that we can ensure gives our cranial base a better sense of stability, then I feel feel like oftentimes that allows us to then uh, attack the visual system or account for those issues in a way that's really addressing what their real average is, you yeah. know. And, yeah. Um, and so, so that tends to be, but, you know, I do have some, I'm in the process of, of working with some of my dentists and my neurooptometrists where we can be on site together oh. for people and having all four of them. <laughs> that would be big. Uh, for certain people where, you know, we've cleared out a lot of outer layers of the onion, you know, and um, now say, okay, now in real time, how do we, can we, we, do we tweak with both? And we've started to chip away at doing that. So that's exciting. That is exciting. Cause I, I mean, I know from experience, like actually if I'm walking on real earth mm -hmm. and then I go on to like, if I'm going walking and we call the reservation, like the wooded area and mm -hmm. I'm on real undulating earth. And then I go on to asphalt. Mm -hmm. I know I notice a decrease in my acuity immediately. Yeah. And so the ground that you're on mm -hmm. will change. And I remember, I remember when I had to go out to Nebraska because mm -hmm. I needed a special prescription. I remember mm -hmm. Ron saying, you know, this is pres your prescription is going to do well for you right now, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know what you're going to need in a week from now. <laughs> right. I don't know if you go into New York, you might need something different. I don't exactly. know if this would be the, the perfect prescription for those shoes. 
And right. this is the founder saying this. And yeah. so when he's saying this, it's because he knows, and now I know, and a lot of us do know, mm -hmm. you don't know how the brain is going to respond. It, it's the brain. Yeah. And you don't know how yeah. that brain is using that visual system for whatever it's using for. And right. conditions change. And it's very conditional. I'm amazed how conditioned, how conditional my visual system has been. Yeah that I was up to 2.7, 3.25 at one point in my left yeah. eye. Yeah. That's, insane. That's a lot of power that I was being given, yeah. which I know now was way too much. And it was trying to kind of making it actually harder for me to focus. But um, yeah, so people want, and, and that, that issue of people needing us like certainty, yeah. because, you know, but they've been suffering, they've been in pain and they want to mm -hmm. know like, all right, what's going to happen now. But the yeah. reality is you can't really know. Right. No, you're right. Because you're everyone's right. brain is slightly different. Everyone's wired differently. You yeah. know, everyone's everyone's walking around with a different size of the pies that make up how our brain works. That are that takes in all that sensory input, comes up with motor plans, bases it on previous experiences, yeah. integrates it with different, you know, uh, things going on in the body. And um, but you're right. It's the, it's the brain. And that's why it, this process has to be, in my opinion, now I'm biased, but this process has to be one where we're able to kind of assess in real time the efficacy of it based on what's happening in that person's system. Absolutely. You know, because there's plenty of times where when we're building these splint, if we if we're just talking about the dental piece of it, that we're building the splint for who they are on that day, but also we're anticipating a little bit of who they're going to be three, four, yeah. five days from now after sleeping a few nights in this thing and all this. And we know where their body's going to want to go and we know what kind of references they need. And we want to make sure that we give them the ability to have a little bit of improvement while not hitting too much too soon in one certain way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way we know is that the body tells us, you know, and just, just last week I was at the dental office for somebody and we had them the bounds and it, in, from my perspective, it was pretty good. And we had them stand, walk, run through tests. He's like, that's good. You know, patient loves it. He's feeling good. He's been through a lot. He's worked hard uh, to, to improve himself. And you know, the dentist is looking at it and he's like, oh, I don't know. I think I would want to take that part off. Right. He's like, I think we're hitting too heavy over here. And I said, I think we have to. I, I said, I think we have to leave it there because if we don't, we're just accommodating for his twisted pattern, but then with a perfect bite, but it's not allowing him to use certain muscles that we were trying to get on. Mm -hmm. So we actually went but went to the table, we laid down, I said, okay, put your mouth right where it feels even on that splint. And he was actually more restricted. And I said, okay, just move it a little bit and to that one side. So, and I said, can you feel that? And he said, yeah, I can feel that. And his neck unlocked beautifully, right? Now, he had been through parts of the process earlier where I knew, okay, we have to we have to set him up better for success because when we gave him what, you know, was by the dental standard yeah. uh, more ideal in the past. He he wore through a piece of it, so I was using information I knew yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can't let him hang out there, yeah. you know. And so, um, so after so we um, when he moved it, it felt great. He texted me two days later. He's like, "This is the best I felt in so long. This is amazing. Thank you so much." You know, it was so, almost like when I don't know if they still do that, but when I was young, <laughs> and the parents don't have much money, they like you buy things in advance, like they'll grow into it. It's right, on right. sale. It's three <laughs> sizes too big, but hey, it's on sale. They'll grow into it. Yeah, is, that, yeah. is that kind of what you have in mind? Like, I know I want that jaw and that cranium to to move a little bit, but if you lock it in right here, it won't have that movement available. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So he was hitting too heavy on on his left side and he wore through that in the past and it helped him to have that contact. But I we I know that as time went on and his body got stressed, he started really digging a deep hole on that one side. So we actually got him a new splint, okay. took care of some visual things um, and started to clear out some of the onion that way. The mm -hmm. dentist was uh, nice enough to make us another one um, and stand by their work. And then we, um, you know, I said, no, I think I want to let his jaw go a little bit more 
forward and to the right and hit yeah. that VG9 a little bit more so it drops off some of this. And then that's in essence to help pull his cranium back yeah. over the way. Yeah. So that, yeah. um, he was able to then get a better, more optimal sense of occlusion in the back and he wasn't trying to create it yeah. uh, on that splint. So. I even had a friend, uh, someone I worked with online and she's out in, well, she was in Oklahoma back then, but then Colorado and she ended up getting a splint because she did have a bit of a crossbite. And, um, but she, she texted me, you know, after she had gotten this one, she's like, Neil, I don't understand. Like I wake up and I'm still on like really grinding on this splint, mm -hmm. even though I feel, I get neutral and I feel better, but she's, mm -hmm. she wakes up like clenching on. And I, I said, I don't know. Well, there's, I brought up the referencing issue in the sense that her brain is using that for some reason as a, but yeah. overusing it. Right. Stabilization as, but I, I don't, I don't really. I don't know. I don't have enough experience because I don't do this often enough. Do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts on why someone might have a splint that seems perfect? It might be what you're talking about. Like yeah. it didn't anticipate that it needs to, that jaw needs to move a little bit or that mm -hmm. those, that cranium needs to expand slightly, which might happen as the jaw starts to move. Do you think mm -hmm. that might be the type of, I mean, there's no way to know, obviously, because you don't know the person, but right. like, have you heard of things like that where they're like, man, I have this splint. I'm yeah, well, I, my test yeah. is better, but I'm grinding on it. Yeah. I think that, um, and her, her testing was definitely better? I wasn't there with her, but I, but she yeah. said yes. So I'm just having okay. to go by what she said. Yeah. yeah so, you know, um, yeah, my first thoughts would be that there's there could be maybe some um, not enough anterior guidance that uh, maybe it, it's um, there's either not enough or what happened was, see, and a lot of times what, what we like to do is we want to make sure that you're not heavy anteriorly, but that you can slightly slide forward and get it, right? So we got to leave a little bit of space, right? You have to kind of reach for the front teeth. Exactly. Just a baby amount of reach to yeah. take you off the back to get things um, that, that jaw sliding. So when you do that and we account for that little bit of space, it's really because we want this cranium to shift back over here, right? Yeah. So sometimes it's built perfectly. And it's like, yep, yeah, just a little bit, not too much. Okay, we're good. But as the cranium learns how to come back, now that buffer, that was, was yeah, the now no longer there. heavier there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before it was like, oh, I'm not hitting it too hard. I'm just barely touching it. Good. Yeah, that's, yeah, what, yeah. that's what we want. But over time, as those pterygoids understood how to move and how that occiput understood how to shift back a little bit, what was once a little bit more space now is not so much reduce space sometimes we have to potentially um change that reference in the front whether it became too much and that has to come down um or if maybe just over time she picked up like a little bit of a buckle cusp and she, her brain's kind of like locking into that sometimes on the back so um and it could just be that if they got bored in, they just kind of have to get smoothed a little bit so that the jaw can slide and not set up shop in, in its home. Um, you know, but, you know, I would think that there could be even just some airway issues that, or maybe the splint could be kind of thick. I don't know. There'd be a lot of things. That, yeah, there's a lot of things. But, yeah, yeah but I've, I've heard things like that. And I'm like, I don't, I mean, I don't have the answer. <laughs> You're not in front of me, so I don't, I, I can't really <laughs> say. All right. So you get it delivered and then generally the bite's going to change a bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And things change and that has to be readjusted. And so what's the expected process with that? Yeah, so um, with the uh, dentists that I work with, they kind of build into the price of the splint, the anticipation that we're gonna have to be back in that office mm -hmm. uh, periodically to adjust it. Um, I never wanna over adjust it by any means, but I do feel like we have to ensure, if, if the intent of this splint is to create a different version of that patient to help them understand how to use parts of their body differently, how to stabilize certain areas, improve the position of things. That has to change the bite, you know, because it all affects the bite. So the splint that is perfect for them on the day that they get it, um, as their body changes, which is what we want, our more lasting permanent changes, then the, the, we're going to have to update the splint to um, to make sure that it's still hitting perfectly as their body shifts. So um, depending on the case, sometimes we'll plan in advance to say, you know what, we better be back here in about a month to adjust this. Or we'll say, you know what, 
Um, if they're getting a splint and they're going through this process, um, it's it's um, relayed that you know this is a tool that helps the work we're doing to repattern your body. So the splint alone is not going to be the ch change of the game. So we have to anticipate that I'm going to be meeting up with them periodically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to be checking to say, all right, is the splint still, every time I see them, is the splint still hitting the way we were or what are you feeling and running through the tests. And sometimes um, we'll see that they'll come in and they're like, yeah, it's not hitting the same, but we'll run through a couple techniques and all of a sudden we get it back. It's like, okay, that yeah. that's that does not need to be adjusted. That just yeah. meant that the patient needed to be adjusted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but if we get them in, you know, a more ideal position from a PRI standpoint, and it's like, nah, I'm still hitting heavy over here, and it's not replicating what it did on that um that day in the office then with the dentist, then it's like, okay, now it's time to adjust the splint. So um it's kind of case by case, but we tend to say you know, it, it, we're probably back in the office maybe a couple of times after getting the splint. And each time, like I said, we have the days, we have appointments blocked out where it's just me, you, and the dentist for an hour, you know, and we're planning on making sure that that splint is perfectly calibrated for the best version of you on that time. Our tests tell us what you need. Um, we're always having you stand, walk, shift weight how does that feel do you feel the ground how do you feel the ground are you moving we're watching what's happening in your gait are your is your arm swinging a little bit more is it swinging less are you keeping are you getting better hip extension is your weight shifting better and we see we see changes in real time and um that all of that helps guide our process which you know sometimes people will reach out to me and they'll say um hey um can you can you tell me a, de a PRI dentist because i want to go get a splint and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, a true PRI splint really uh, requires um, the team, you know, of, of being able to kind of look at all the things like you were talking about. What happens when you lay down versus standing up and what how this splint is built has to be to help move the needle for your overall health and your overall movement system and your overall ability to use both sides of your body. Yeah. Um you know, and, and this is a not in any way a knock on the dentist profession, but um, in most cases, um, a splint itself, without the kind of feedback of what's really happening in all those other areas of the body, might not necessarily be able to do um, to get the job done completely. You know, it, it, but of course, I'm biased, right? So, right. Well, um, again, it's not their training. You know, that's, right. And they, exactly. Yeah. It's nobody's fault. It's not, you that's know, the way it is. Yeah, it's no, it's not malpractice by anybody to, right, right, to right. not be doing it that way. It's just that we feel like this is a way that helps, uh, help helps the patient in a more globally holistic way. Yeah. So the last thing is a lot of people will say, "Well, do I have to wear this thing forever?" Right. Yeah. And it depends on the situation. You hope not, <laughs> but it also depends on how much whether orthodontists need it or what they have to do, you know, in right. the future to hold that position to not, if they take the splint out and it's the bite never really closed or it didn't, re, like, you know, there's other dental issues. Well, uh, you know, it depends on the situation, obviously. Right, exactly. Yeah, certainly depends on the situation. Um, you know, the, if, theoretically, the splint is not, in, is, is only intended to be a short-term solution. But in some cases, the long-term solution for people is not ideal or not realistic or not even needed, you know? So some people might not have a perfect occlusion, but they feel good enough just by, we get them to a point where maybe they just got to sleep with the splint and they're like, you know what? I feel good enough. I got my, my techniques. I know how to manage it. And like, you know, the alternative of, going the next step which would be some orthodontia now that i'm neutral you know um uh some orthodontia um that's not realistic sometimes that's not realistic financially or just um cosmetically for people um so you know sometimes the splint is does become a more of a long-term type of uh thing sometimes it's not sometimes the splint gets us 
better, but doesn't check all the boxes of what somebody wants uh, or needs uh, as far as some other things they had going on, like if their palette is really narrow and they're a candidate really for some expansion or an ALF. And that's why I work with some of the dentists that I do because we have, they have the tools to be able to add those pieces in sure. if we need to. Uh, and, um, and sometimes, you know, it is, it is braces at the end. So um, I've, I've been, I, I've been a patient of all of those multiple <laughs> out braces, you know, as an yeah. adult, multiple splints, you know, so, um, but it's all about, you know, meeting the person at where they're at on their journey based on, and there's so many variables that go into it, you know, um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we do what we have to do to just keep maximizing uh, the function for the patient. All right, cool. All right.